this is uh, lecture 7 okay so the last lecture we saw uh, quite an important fact okay the fact we saw is that uh, the entire waveform channel model which we've been considering so far y of t is x of t plus n of t okay so this is the model that we've been looking at and we tend to think that this is actually an infinite dimensional model where each the signal at, at each time instant is very important right so you, you might think this an infinite amount of data that we have to process to get through any kind of information but it turns out since we are only sending a finite number of bits you only need a finite number of different x of t's right and that you can use basic linear algebra to write in terms of a basis and then you immediately convert that into a vector once you convert into a vector it's finite dimensional and you see it's it gives you the true picture okay so not just the picture in terms of the waveform in terms of how much information what you need to process to get all the information you need okay so how exactly is your information being represented in 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 the signal so to speak not not in each time instant except that only what's really important is this coefficients that are multiplying the basis okay so i'll i'll briefly run through it's, it's quite important that we understand this so whenever we do this right in general you would think n of t is, uh, is in some space x of t is in some space etc i did a series of simplifications to show how when you have uh, when you're sending a sequence of bits right which get mapped by the transmitter into x of t and then noise gets added to it okay so what should be the first thing that you do in the receiver when you receive this y of t okay you should know ahead of time the basis vectors basis signals which were used to generate all the x of t and the first thing you should do is do a correlation with y of t with each of those basis vectors to find basically the projection of y of t on that space so behind the projection first and then you try to do your decoding okay so you have to project first so i'll say simply project by correlation and we also saw before that this correlation can be accomplished by filtering right what type of filtering is it was it called i gave it a special name what matched filtering right so it's called matched filtering the impulse response is matched to the correlation correlating signal that you need okay so you do phi star of minus t for instance so you can think of that also as a filtering okay so once you do this it turns out you get a vector y okay and this vector completely represents complete holds all the information that you possibly want about b okay so if you're only worried about b then everything is held by this vector y you don't need any other information so remember when when you do correlation x of t goes through the correlation n of t also goes through the correlation right so x of t plus n of t right that also goes through the correlation so by by saying y is enough what i'm saying is it's enough if you look at the n of t in in your space it's the anything any component of n of t orthogonal to it can be completely ignored okay so as far as decoding is concerned because given y everything else you have is independent of x of t okay so that's the main uh, idea here okay so the basis is quite important phi1 of t to set phi m of t okay so you project onto the space spanned by these basis elements okay so this is the picture that enables us to go from the waveform channel to a completely vector channel where i'm going to say my bits b is getting mapped by the transmitter into what into a vector x okay what is this vector x each component is that complex number which multiplies the basis to give you x of t okay so that's a simple vector model plus the noise also we can represent using a vector how do i do that again i assume the noise goes through the correlator okay so the noise is the noise and noise in noise here in y okay so that is noise that has gone through the correlator that we did some calculations to show will be what normal with zero mean 
okay zero mean and variance covariance matrix n not by 2 i okay so i being the identity uh, matrix okay so you do this you get a vector y okay so the important thing to remember here is everything here is random right b is a b is one of two par n possibilities you assume a uniform distribution for starting out with maybe we'll change that later so which makes x also a discrete typically a discrete random vector okay with the distribution is given very simply by the distribution of b b to x is hopefully a one to one mapping okay and then the distribution of n is known it's iid normal okay so when i i wrote it down in vector form right so what is this actually iid normal zero mean variance n not by 2 right so i know my n is also distributed in a very simple way so from all this i can compute fy y okay so i can compute this in fact i can even compute the conditional distribution of y given x okay so these two quantities in particular this quantity will prove to be very very important okay so what's the conditional distribution of y given a particular x okay so we'll see so the problem now has become what i mean it's become a simple vector problem right right so you can imagine given a certain joint distribution for x and y you have to go ahead and find what x could have been given that you observe y okay so that's the classic version of what's called a detection problem okay so i know x and y have a certain joint distribution and i'm observing y okay x has so many possibilities i have to pick that x which could have been transmitted okay so we'll define some matrix for it so what's my goal when i do that my goal is i want to minimize my probability of error okay i want to make sure that the probability that i say the wrong x was transmitted is minimal okay so the, all that we'll see later on okay so we'll see how a detection problem is defined carefully and how one can one can uh, do these things efficiently and so on and so forth we'll see all that later but for now i want you to be convinced of this very much because from now on i'll pretty much be completely dealing with the vector version okay so quite often we'll only be talking about the vector version okay so the vector version has a lot of useful information about the waveform version and in fact for decoding it's complete okay there's no problem nothing else you need okay any questions on this anything that is disturbing you anything that you have possibly thought about it's okay so this is crucial okay you should know where this is coming from okay we'll do one simple calculation one thing you might be worried about is what about the parameters that were of interest to me in my original waveform channel what was the what were the parameters worried about power bandwidth bitrate and probability of error okay so can i can compute all those things faithfully in this vector model as well once i can do that i can completely throw away the waveform model right so i can happily deal with only the vector model okay so we'll start with one of those things it turns out everything cannot be easily computed so for one or two you have to go back to the waveform model and know how we are going back okay but most things can be very readily calculated the way i defined x turns out you can easily compute the average power how will you compute the average power okay so what's the average power in x of t okay so x of t what's the distribution of x of t the way i wrote it down i said it's equal to xi of t with probability 1 by 2 power n okay so and then what did i do i took xi of t and then wrote it as a linear combination xij fj of t i said j j runs from 1 to m what do i know about the fj of t they are orthonormal okay so now if i compute the power in xi of t okay right if i for instance do expect so if i do xi square of t okay the instantaneous power and then integrate it out okay over all time so i should be careful i'll say energy okay as opposed to power so i'll i'll do xi square of t then integrate it out for all t suppose i do that what will i get can i compute it with simply the xi js 
Yeah, so you can do that. You square the right hand side, you will get a whole bunch of terms and then you integrate from 0 to I mean, minus infinity to infinity, what will what will remain? Only the individual square terms will remain. All the cross terms will vanish because my phi i of phi j of t are orthonormal. Okay, and what about the square terms also? They will simply be x i j squared, right? The other inner product will be 1 because I have normalized my phi j. Okay, so you get all that for free. So it turns out the energy of x of t x i of t, okay, remember what's, how, what am I defining energy to be? x i square of t integrated from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, That's my definition for energy. Okay, So this turns out to be norm of, well, norm square of x the vector. Okay, So I think I called it x i, right? I'm sorry, the x i vector. Okay, So that's good. Right, so if I now want to compute the average energy in x of t, what can I do? Right, I'm going to take the average energy over all x i of t. One, right, so that's that. I can do the same thing with the random vector x. Okay, so the average energy in x of t will be expected value of mod x square. Okay, so that's how it will work out. Okay, so. <coughs> So let me write that down, maybe down here, do we have space? Okay, so maybe I'll go off to the next page. Yeah, so. Okay, so the energy, okay, average, I'm not saying average here, it's obviously it's average. Energy of x of t can be computed as expected value of norm x squared. Okay, so this is a discrete random vector and presumably one can compute expected values for it very very easily it's simple summation right so it's very easy to do okay so energy is taken care of you might say power but energy is good enough right so both of them are the same roughly if you say if you know the time interval it's fine okay so energy i'm able to compute you can go back with the discrete model itself bandwidth is a little bit more difficult okay so if i only give you the exercise of t's bandwidth is not so easy you need to really know the shape of the signaling waveform you need to know so many other things. So bandwidth maybe one cannot immediately compute. What else was important? Bit rate, one can compute knowing the support. Okay, If you know the support of these x of t's, you can compute the bit rate. And the last thing is probability of error and that can be accurately estimated just with the random vector model. You don't need to go back to the x of t. Okay? So I just showed you one, the others can also be done in specific cases. I will show you how to go about doing it. Okay, So like we will see next. Okay, so I'm going to postpone this detection problem for a little bit later. We'll see a whole bunch of examples of uh, designing these, uh, these, these transmitters, what to do with the modulator, how does it translate into the vector model for several simple cases, which you can maybe uh, relate to in a very intuitive and nice way. Okay, so that's what we'll do for the remainder of this class. Okay, so the first model and the simplest model First, first modulator and simplest modulator. Uh, okay, so so these are all examples of modulators. Okay, the first one uh, is what I will call binary phase shift keying. Okay, so this name may not be uh, that clear to you now, but we'll see. We'll see why this is okay. BPSK for short. Okay, it's also called binary antipodal signaling and so many other names. Okay, so but BPSK is what I'll use first. Okay, so right now uh, in in all these examples, I'll assume that the bandwidth W of the channel is much much larger than one by T. Okay, so one by T will roughly be my uh, signaling frequency okay so a bit rate roughly okay so I'll assume my bandwidth is much much larger than my bit rate okay so you'll see the way I design it my modulated signals will have a huge bandwidth and all of that will have to go through so right now I'll almost assume infinite bandwidth and say bandwidth I'm not worried too much about okay so I'll simply say whatever x of t I put in the same x of t without any distortions will be available in 
at the receiver right so there's no convolution the convolution by h of t like we just we got rid of it but even the bandwidth will say is much much larger than the 1 by t so even this 1 by t will not play any role in my uh, in my uh, problem okay so i'll remove that for now and then we'll later on go and modify it because this needs to be modified okay this is very crucial okay you want your 1 by t to be as close as possible to your bandwidth okay so you'll see later on bandwidth is a very precious commodity okay particularly in wireless today you pay a lot of money for bandwidth so you want to use every every hertz of your bandwidth very very efficiently we'll see later on that this is a bad thing but for now we'll just take it just to get get to understand how the signaling is done and all that okay so typically something else is done in practice okay nevertheless there are situations where this assumption still holds okay can you name one situation where this might hold it's a very popular and common transmission medium where this will optics for instance right so even today with however fast data rate you can transmit electronically the optical frequencies that are available are huge okay so 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 here that that assumption still holds and in largely in optical domain people still use some more, some form of this bpsk type things so they don't do anything very fancy okay so but in wireless and all certainly this doesn't hold and people want to optimize every hertz in their use okay so what is bpsk now the first choice you'll see is a choice for how many bits am i going to deal with at a time okay so we'll say n equals 1 okay so we'll set one bit at a time okay so once you say one bit my entire vector b becomes what simply just one guy i'll call it b okay and how many waveforms do i need i need just two waveforms the first one i'll call x 0 t okay so i'll use a slightly crazy notation you'll see why i did that i will set okay my x0 of t to be within my support of course but within my support it's going to be constant okay so this t was my support i'm not going to exceed it but it's going to be constant and root es by t why did i pick root es by t yeah then if you compute energy for x0 of t you'll get es which i can think of as my signal energy which is a nice notation to have okay so x1 of t i will take as minus root es by t in the same support okay all right so so if you want to plot this it's, it's quite trivial okay x o of t is going to be 0 and t it's going to be root es by t okay then you have minus root es by t and x1 of t i'll do with dotted lines Okay, so this guy is x o of t. This guy is x one of t. Okay, so that's your. Uh, so you see why? Do you think phase shift keying makes sense to you? Okay, so I'm doing 180 degree phase reversal if you want, so multiplying by minus one. Okay, so so that's what I'm doing uh, here when I do this. Okay. all right so what about uh, so you see why i'm saying bandwidth has to be much much larger than 1 by t if i have if i want to have any hope of getting this exact signal at the receiver right so you need a huge bandwidth so this 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 is going to correspond to a sink in the spectrum and unless you get at least like six or seven lobes of the sink you have no hope of getting anything close to this x of t at the receiver okay so to be have to have some hope of being able to have this as my modulating signal okay your bandwidth has to be much much large okay so remember you, you you tend to think of x of t as what the signal is at the transmitter the way i wrote my model x of t is actually the signal at the receiver right right before the noise is getting added all that is going through the channel has already happened right in fact i took my uh, even the loss to be one right so everything is gone so the so the channel has to have a huge bandwidth if this x of t has to make its way all the way from transmitter to receiver without any distortion Okay, so that you see, all right. So that assumption is needed. Later on, we'll relax it and see how to change that. Okay, the smart ways of doing it. But for now, we'll say this is our uh, x of t. Okay, so bandwidth is quite large, and the energy is E s. Okay, so average energy is E s, right? Do you see that? Bandwidth is much much larger than. 1 by t i'm saying much much larger but it's like 10 times okay so 10 times is a huge uh, waste of the bandwidth right okay so so if you do gram smith 
what will you get? What will be, how many basis elements do you think you'll need to span this signal set? Just one, right? So my dimension is going to be one. So if I do Gram-Schmidt, you don't have to go through all the complicated process. It's very clear that this is a one-dimensional signaling space, okay? So all my signals can be represented as multiples of just one basis signal and that basis signal will be what? root 1 by t between 0 and t. Okay, so that's the orthonormal signal that will generate this and your dimension will work out to 1. Okay, so my signals when they when I convert them into vectors under this basis, what will be the vector representation? What will be the vector x0? I'm sorry? plus root es right just one dimension okay so there's only one quantity and x1 is going to be minus root es okay so 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 these vectors are said to live in what's called signal space okay so that space that vector space on which x0 and x1 lie is called the signal space so x, x0 of t and x1 of t are signals and the corresponding vectors lie in signal space just to give you give you a name okay so we always call this space right so it's just to give you a name for that we're going to say they live in signal space so how does the signal space look now it's just one dimension okay so my entire signal space is only one dimension maybe i'll put down the origin just to be sure so where are my signals in the signal space one at root es another at minus root es Okay, so that's my signal space. So my entire signal space is simply one dimensional. Okay, so, so it's much, much simpler than looking at every single T and worrying about what to do with the entire waveform. You simply correlate it to the receiver, get one, one number corresponding to each X of T and that's good enough. Okay, so that's the, that's the standard uh, notion. All right, so my, uh, my signal my in my vector form the x is going to have just one component x so my random vector x becomes a random variable okay and this random variable has got what distribution okay it's going to be plus root es with probability half and minus root es with probability half so this is what i'm doing in my vector model x of t becomes this one random variable x which is going to be plus root es with probability half and minus root es with probability half okay so you can go ahead and check if you will that expected value of x squared works out to what okay it's all real right so i don't have to worry about modulus works out to es as well okay in terms of just random variables works out to es just like we thought it should okay all right so So what should happen at the receiver? So at the receiver, okay, I'll, I'll draw the waveform model also to show you just the complete picture. So at the receiver, you're going to receive a waveform R of T. Okay, what are you supposed to do with R of T? Correlate with phi one of T, right? So which is basically what? What is correlating with phi one of T? You integrate from 0 to t okay so there's lots of assumptions here so what do i mean by integrating from 0 to t what is my 0 and what is my t okay once i know my 0 i'll know what my t, t is so do i know i mean so so many things so you have to know where your 0 is and you should know the length t okay both of those things need to be known so there's some synchronization problem and all that which you will face typically okay so assuming all that has been already done okay assuming you know where your 0 is and you know the accurate value for t all you have to do is integrate from 0 to t pretty much okay of course there are some constant scaling here and there but you don't have to worry too much about it and then you get one value okay well, there is a 1 by root t right so let me put that down okay you get one value which we will call y which we know will be equal to what x plus n right what will be this n now x i know what will be n it's normal with zero mean and variance 
n0 by 2 okay so what do, how do i figure out n0 by 2 like i said at your receiver it's possible to measure these things okay so somebody will tell you what your n0 by 2 is okay so for comfort you can just call it n0 by 2 in your model okay so assuming somebody tells you what it is okay is that clear so that's that's my model my entire bpsk model assuming i have a lot of bandwidth is really really simple what am i transmitting in signal space one of two things either plus root es or minus root es in fact you can even normalize es to one and think of plus one and minus one okay so either send plus one or minus one based on whether or not my bit is zero or one okay what happens to that to that point in signal space some noise gets added to it which is even which is normal with mean zero and variance n naught by 2 okay and you will get some y okay so it's enough if you process that y okay so you don't have to worry about each and every time instant r of t at each t simply integrate it from 0 to t and only look at that value okay it's enough and it's optimal you don't have to worry about losing any information in that okay convince yourself that that's true all right so if you repeat this experiment several times and if you plot y okay each time you get Okay, so that part, that part is called the received signal space if you want. So received points in signal space. Transmitted points are always what? Plus root ES and minus root ES. The received points will be around plus root ES and minus root ES depending on the value of N0 by 2. If N0 by 2 is really, really small, it's going to be very close to those values. If N0 by 2 is large, it's going to be reasonably spread out, but it will be around that. When will you, when do you think you will make errors even without going through the detection problem in detail? When do you think you will make errors? What do you do with the Y to determine B? What's the very intuitive and simple thing to do? Yeah, if it's positive, you say it was, say bit 0 because maybe bit 0 corresponded to this and bit 1 corresponded to this. And if it's negative, you say bit 1. It seems like a very simple thing to do. We'll derive it formally and confirm that that intuition is justified even in theory. Okay, so we'll do that later on, but for now that can be easily done. So when will you make an error? When your noise is large enough so that the point gets moved to the other side of the origin. Okay, so you need a large enough noise. Okay, so this picture is called a constellation, a signal constellation. Basically, signal space along with what? Along with the points that represent your signal. Okay, so on the transmitter side, the signal constellation will be very simple. It will only contain two points on the receiver side what will your signal constellation contain a lot of points presumably if you run it several times you'll get all kinds of points okay so it will be much more random on this received side okay so that's what uh, happens here all right so the first uh, interesting thing to do in this problem is how do you compute fy given x what is this distribution Okay, yeah, so you have to, whenever a condition, I have to specify the conditioning random variable, right? So if x is plus 1, what is the distribution? Okay, so this will work out to two possibilities. One is, one is what? Normal with mean plus 1 and variance n0 by 2 if x is plus 1 and normal with mean minus 1 and variance n0 by 2 if x is minus 1. Okay, and what will be fy, the distribution of y alone? I'm sorry? If we are using? There will be a root es. Oh, I'm sorry. I put plus one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I should be careful. So I'm used to thinking of BPSK as plus one minus one. It's very strange to see ES after a long time. Okay, so you need root ES minus root ES. And what about FY? PDF for Y. Yeah, so you have to convolve X and N, right? So you'll get two. A mixture Gaussian as it's called. Such a distribution is called a mixture Gaussian. There are two Gaussians centered at plus root s and minus root s each with probability half. So if you plot it, it will work out to something like this. Fy of y 
this is y will work out to something like this minus root s plus root s okay what's the value what's this height who can tell me what this height will be give me an approximate answer first and then an accurate answer what's the approximate answer 1 by 2 root 2 yeah so it's a 0.5 okay so 0.5 divided by what root 2 pi then what yeah so yeah you have sigma sigma will be square root of n not by 2 okay so that's what you have that's approximate what's accurate what's the accurate value what should you do why am i saying that's approximate Well, you have a contribution from this <laughs> this normal distribution also. Well, it will be very very small, but it will it'll have one e power minus whatever e s and all that. But who knows? I mean, that might be a significant part. You never know, depending on the value of e s. Okay, so this normal will also add to that. Okay, so that's the accurate expression. You can write it down if you want. All right. What about this point? What is the height? Okay, so there will be some exponential paths, right? So two times it will be a little bit ugly, but one can do it. Okay, what's the probability that y is positive? Half, you sure? Okay, yeah, it's very easy. What's the probability that y is greater than plus root s? Okay, so we'll have to do some computation. It's not it's not all that straightforward, but roughly, what will the value be? Yeah, one by four, right? So you can see it'll be close to one by four. If if your noise is smaller compared to ES, it'll be close to one by four. But there'll be another term, another Q term adding. It's a large Q term, so you don't have to worry too much about it. But it might always be there. All right. So those are just questions to make sure that somebody at least is taking my plea for reading up on random process and Gaussian random variable seriously. Okay. So if questions like this, if you think a lot later on, there'll be much more complicated questions you'll have to answer. so you better have gaussian random variables at your fingertips all right so this is bpsk okay any questions once again i have described a very simple version which is which assumes a lot of bandwidth but but at least it's, uh, it's there okay so 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 this is uh, this is is this is this a base band or a pass band signaling method it's base band right so there's no pass band uh, thing here so the frequency is going to die down eventually after some time so you can think of it as base band up to some approximation okay but technically it has a huge band okay but it's clearly base band it's not around anything else okay all right so there are some modifications there's something called on off keying instead of going plus root es and minus root es if you say say plus root uh, 2 es and 0 okay so if you do either you either on or off okay so which is what is usually done in optics you either shine light or you shut down Okay, so that's the on-off signaling. In what way will it be different from BPSK? What what do you, what are the changes can you expect? Okay, so imagine see right as it is there is really no change right. I mean if you just look at one signaling interval zero to t, you're assuming it's going it's going to go through. There is really no change. Nothing changes. Your PDF for y will change. How will it change? this thing will entirely shift but the 0 and root 2 root es will be there so it's not root 2 es maybe so it's not 2 root es it's root 2 es slightly different but other than that nothing seems to change but when you string together a lot of signaling intervals some things will change okay so when i define uh, if i repeat this process over several signaling intervals okay so i have to be slightly careful supposing i can do that then things will change okay so for that for that repeated process we'll see bpsk and the repeated process will have different type of spectrums okay so dc component for instance will be very different okay so all these things uh, one needs to take into account but uh, typically this can be done all right so so that's uh, bpsk okay
Okay, so I have a picture of the waveform. I think it's that's okay. We don't need it. Okay, so the next thing we'll see will be a passband signaling method. Okay, very very elementary and simple example of a passband signaling method, which I will call frequency shift keying. Okay, or FSK for short. Okay, once again we'll pick n to be one, so we'll took we'll look at one bit at a time. Okay, so my b is just one b. It's going to be zero or one with equal probability. Okay, so I need to define two signals. The first one I'll define x zero of t as root two e s by t cosine two pi. Uh, I'll write it explicitly this time. M zero t by t between zero and t. Okay. And uh, so this this frequency of this m zero by t I'll denote as f zero. Okay. And x one of t will be two times root two e s by t. Sine. Okay. No. Once again, I'll say cos. Cos two pi m one t by t. Okay. Once again, between t and t, and f one will also be m one by t. Okay. So m zero and m one are integers. Okay. So without any trouble, we can take them as positive integers. Okay. M zero and m one should not be the same. Clearly, if they are the same, then there's no there's both signals are same. Why did I do this root 2 es by t? Yeah, so the norm of x0 of t will work out to norm square of x0 of t will work out to es exactly, which is what I want. So my my average energy in the signal from 0 to t is will work out to es. Okay, so that's what I want. All right. So you can plot if you want for m0 1 and m0 2. I have a plot here, but it's not too critical. So you see, if plotting is not too bad. Okay. So what about bandwidth? Answer this question for me. So think of. Uh, so what about bandwidth for this x0 of t, for instance? How will the spectrum of x0 of t look? How do you answer this question? Yeah, it'll be shink shifted on, sink shifted on, both sides, right? Right? Is that clear? Okay, hopefully that's clear. So, so the way to do this is the trick is take cos spreading out everywhere and then multiply by a rect. Okay, so think of x0 of t as a rect multiplied by a cosine. Cosine will go to two deltas. Rect will go to a sink, but you have to convolve in the frequency domain, so things will move towards f0 and f1. So Bandwidth. So this is technically going to be a passband signal. Okay. So, but the bandwidth is around f0 and f1. Okay. So I'll assume I have a large bandwidth around f0 and f1 available to me. Very, very large bandwidth around f0 and f1 available to me. Today, that is a very, very bad assumption to make. Okay. So pretty much there's no spectrum that's free out there, not in such large quantity. So you can think of the inverse assumption. So whatever spectrum you have, you take t to be so large that my 1 by t will fit nicely into that spectrum. Okay, so that's the practical interpretation to this. So I'll be signaling very, very slowly, but it doesn't matter. I'll be within my spectrum according to this limitation. So once again, we need large bandwidth to justify this signaling. We'll see later on how to get rid of that. But for now, we'll assume that and go ahead and proceed and understand it, and then we'll come back and apply these ideas. Okay, so the bandwidth is large around f0 and f1. Typically, you take f0 and f1 to be reasonably close, not too far away. Okay, so you want to occupy some band, right? You don't want to be very far away. All right. So, what do you think will happen if you do Gram-Schmidt on this? Yeah. So you'll get two different uh, things. Do you see that? Okay. So it's very easy to see also which ones they will be. Okay. So what will be phi one of t? Okay. So you'll get m equals two, and phi one of t you can take to be Root 2 by t cosine 2 pi f not t between 0 and t, and phi phi 2 you can take as what? Same thing. Root 2 by t cosine 2 pi f1 t 
between 0 and t. Right? Is that fine? So, f0 and f1 being integer multiples of 1 by t, these two will be orthogonal as well. So, if you multiply them and integrate over the 0 to t interval, you will get them to vanish and each of them will be also unit norm. Okay, So, you can see that also will hold. Okay, So, this is a, a valid uh, orthogonal signal. Okay, Alright, so, so once I do this, what will be my vectors x0? plus root es 0 ok so I have been thinking of transpose all the time so I will write transpose my vector x1 is 0 plus root es transpose so you see I already had a get a two dimensional signal space ok my signal space is two dimensional if I want to draw it how will it look ok my origin is here so my one signal will be here say bit 0 and bit 1 will be here ok so this is my constellation fsk constellation if you will alright Okay, so you can once again compute the expected value of the random weight, random variable x which denotes uh, random vector x which denotes signal you will see the average uh, energy works out to es everything. Okay, so uh, remember I have the vector that represents my signal is actually x which should be x1, x2. Okay, alright. So, what's the distribution for x1? Okay, for x, you know what the distribution is. It takes value root ts 0 with probability half and 0 minus root and 0 root ts with probability half. What about the distribution for x1? 0 and root ts with probability half each. Similarly, x2 will be 0 and root ts with probability half each. Okay, are x1 and x2 independent? No, it's not. Okay, so it cannot be independent. Okay, right. So if independent, then x, x should take so many more values. It cannot just take two values. Okay, so it's not independent. Okay, so it's one of those cases where you can't reduce it into some kind of a one-dimensional problem. It will only be two-dimensional. Okay. So what do you do at the receiver then? Okay. So once again, I'll I'll do that in detail for this case, and then then we'll maybe stop bothering about it. Maybe we will. I don't know. Okay. So at the receiver. When you get an R of t, what should you do? You should do two correlations. Okay, so one is a correlation with phi one of t. The other is a correlation with phi two of t. You get two signals, two values out, y one and y two. Okay, and then you go through a detection process with this y. Okay, so my y becomes x plus n. What's my n? Okay, this n is n1, n2, iid, normal, zero mean, variance, n0 by 2. Okay, is that fine? Okay, so what's the joint distribution for y1 and y2 or basically what's the distribution for y is it going to be jointly gaussian y1 and y2 will be jointly gaussian how many of you think y1 and y2 will be jointly gaussian yes no maybe how many of you think no 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 right it cannot be jointly gaussian what will it be yeah sum of two jointly gaussians mixture goes mixture jointly gaussian you can maybe say but it's not Definitely jointly Gaussian, right? So, how will it look? Okay, so in the signal space, how will it look? You have one point at 0 root ES, another point at root ES 0. Now, all your received points will be around both of those points, and there will be a Gaussian centered around each of those signal points at the receiver. Okay, so when you try to plot the Fy, well, I can't plot it here. If you try to plot the distribution for Y, you will have two Gaussians, one centered at each 
transmitted signal point okay both of them will be circularly symmetric around that point okay but you'll have to add both of them up with half okay so you'll get a crazy type expression okay so that's how that's how the received constellation will look okay so one question i want to ask before we proceed just to see how comfortable you've become okay suppose i ask you to derive some kind of a baseband equivalent picture of this pass band signaling scheme how many of you think you'll be comfortable doing it do you think that makes sense should i worry about a baseband equivalent picture for this pass band signaling scheme i should right i just i, I showed in the first class or the second class that every pass band real signal which is what we are dealing with here has a baseband complex signal as its equivalent okay so start off with that let's go back to this picture tell me what's the complex envelope of x0 of t is take a couple of minutes and try to derive it complex envelope is a sink I can see several people not even thinking about trying. Okay. I'm sorry. What do you mean complex envelope in the frequency domain? I'm not interested in all that. I want x0 tilde of t, which is the. Take your time. I mean, it's not. something that you can think your way through think about it. write down write down some things you'll get an answer sorry rect okay is it a real function it's real the complex envelope is real how many of you think the complex convex complex envelope will work out to be real <laughs> approximately real <laughs> <laughs> what is approximately real okay so no no give me a precise answer you're giving me all kinds of answers what is x0 tilde of t okay so that's the assignment for tomorrow's for next week's class okay so monday morning 8 o'clock it's the first thing i'm going to ask nobody answers that question we are not proceeding okay so we'll wait till everybody finishes that okay somebody has to come up with an answer for me Hey, what is x0 tilde of t? x1 tilde of t. Can we get any kind of expression, or does it does it seem to work, or doesn't work? What is the bus, pass, base band equivalent picture for this pass band signaling scheme? Okay, so that's the question you have to deal with. We'll stop here for this class. The next thing is something else which is new. Okay, think about it and come back.